So I know that uh, it's early on a Sunday morning and people are still uh, coming into the auditorium, but uh, just to keep us on schedule, let's, um, let's get started as people continue to come in. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the New York Historical Society. I'm Louise Mirror, New York Historical's president and CEO, and it really is pretty thrilling to see all of you here today in our beautiful Robert H. Smith Auditorium for the second annual Diane and Adam E. Max Conference in Women's History, this year focused on reproductive rights in an historical context. Our chair, Pam Schaffler, is with us this morning, and I want to recognize Pam. There's Pam in that orange. <laughs> that Pam is here this morning is one of many, many manifestations of uh, her great leadership and also her great support and encouragement for the work that this institution has been doing and uh, will be doing in even greater force uh, over the next few years in women's history. So thanks so very much, Pam, for, uh, for being here and also for leading us into this, uh, this great new territory. Um, I also want to recognize Diane Max, who is here with us this morning. Diane, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I want to thank both Diane and Adam for Adam Max for helping us to become a locus for public engagement around important topics in women's history. Diane and Adam's support has not only enabled today's conference, but uh, also a salon series that takes place throughout the year. As some of you know well, Diane has worked tirelessly in the field of reproductive rights for a very long time. And it's particularly gratifying that our conference theme this year speaks both to her commitment to women's history and also to her great dedication to that work. This spring, the New York Historical Society will officially open its new Center for Women's History, of which this conference is, of course, a key part. There will be a set of physical spaces on our renovated fourth floor, as well as opportunities in addition to the Max conference and salons for scholars to push forward the frontiers of knowledge about women's history. The center has already benefited hugely from a stellar academic advisory committee led by Alice Kessler Harris, and I want to thank Alice and all the members of uh, our academic advisory committee for their great work, some of the fruits of which you'll see later on today. Um, and I'd just like to thank as well Joyce Cowan for her partnership and visionary support of our new Joyce B. Cowan Women's History Gallery and its inaugural exhibition, Saving Washington. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the outstanding contributions of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Jean Margot Reed, the estate of Jean Dubinsky Appleton, our trustee, Eric Wallach and Daria Wallach, Deutsche Bank, Claudine and Fred Bacher, the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation, the Caroline M. Lowndes Foundation, and Hogan Lovells, the corporate sponsor of New York Historical's Women's History Public Programming. I'm delighted to welcome Michael Silver of Hogan Lovells today. Michael spearheaded this unique partnership. And of course, we're very, very grateful indeed to all the many individuals and organizations who have made uh, this um, inauguration of our Center for Women's History possible. So my colleague, Valerie Paley, our Vice President and Chief Historian and the Director of our new Center for Women's History, has, uh, as many of you know, done incredible work in building the foundations of this first ever Center for Women's History within the walls of a museum. I pinch myself uh, every day to believe how lucky I am to count on Valerie's great talents and skills. Valerie is a graduate of Vassar College. She holds an MA in American Studies and a PhD in History from Columbia. I want to invite her to the stage now to uh, make some opening remarks and also to introduce our keynote speaker, Jill Lepore, who is the recipient of many accolades, including New York Historical's own 2015 book prize for The Secret History of Wonder Woman, Valerie Paley. Thank you, Louise, and good morning. 
I'd like to second Louise's welcome and thank you all once again for coming out to the second annual Diane and Adam E. Max Conference in Women's History. Our center is a groundbreaking initiative to explore the pivotal role women have played in American history, which we will articulate through exhibitions, public programs like this one, scholarship and education. In the coming weeks, when the physical space of the center opens upstairs on our fourth floor, the Center for Women's History will be distinguished as the first initiative of its kind in the nation within the walls of a museum to embrace this essential subject. This coming Wednesday, International Women's Day, the inaugural exhibition of our Joyce B. Cowan Gallery of Women's History will open to the public. The show will recast traditional founding fathers' narrative to discover how Dolly Madison, and the women of the early republic more generally, helped to secure American democracy at its most tenuous moment. These women inhabited the same spheres as our founding fathers, whose names are well known, yet their critical role in making we the people function is barely recognized and very rarely told. We are calling the exhibition Saving Washington. For those of you who happen to be taking the day off from work on Wednesday, uh, please join us here for this auspicious opening. Beyond its exhibitions, the center is also an archive and an engine for learning. We've had an extraordinary first year. As Louise has mentioned, uh, highlights have included Billie Jean's extensive donation of iconic and archival items from throughout her career, our co-production with Columbia University of a massive open online course, which you'll hear about later, and a host of public discussions, including our first annual Diane and Adam Emax Conference in Women's History last year, which was focused on the garment industry. Today, our keynote speaker is Jill Lepore, the David Woods Kemper 41 Professor of American History at Harvard University and a staff writer at The New Yorker, where she writes about American history, politics, technology, and law. Her books include The Name of War, winner of the Bancroft Prize, New York Burning, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, Book of Ages, a finalist for the National Book Award, The Secret History of Wonder Woman, winner of our American History Book Prize at the New York Historical Society. She is currently writing a history of the United States. Please join me in welcoming Jill Lepore to begin our morning sessions. Good morning, thanks so much. Uh, it's delightful to be here. I wanna thank Louise and Valerie and also Diane and Adam Max for this tremendously exciting center and for the exhibit that's about to open. Um, could not be more timely. Um, can we move to my, great, thanks. Um, this, is my <laughs> this is my only chance to nod to the vagina monologues. Let me just be, <laughs> Let me just be honest, it's early on a very cold Sunday morning. Um, I also want to begin by thanking the other speakers here today, the distinguished scholars and activists who you'll be hearing from this morning and this afternoon. It's an honor to appear on a program with so many people uh, in whose debt I stand, um, the, especially the historians who've done the work to write the history of the reproductive rights movement and the legal scholars who've been engaged in the legal battles that have brought us to where we stand today. My job here this morning is to really provide an overview for you of the history of the reproductive rights movement on this, the 100th anniversary of the trial of Margaret Sanger for opening the first birth control clinic in the United States in nearby Brooklyn. But this happens to be as well the 75th anniversary of Wonder Woman, the comic book superhero, and since those two stories are very much tied together, as my Pussyhat Chronicles illustration is intended to remind you, <laughs> I'm going to tell both of those stories together, because I think there's a lot to be learned in seeing them in relationship to one another. And I think there's a lot that we failed to see by not seeing them in relationship to one another. My clicker is not working, so... No, that's them using, <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you have another clicker you wanna bring down here for me? Okay. Um, 
Margaret Sanger was born in 1879, which is just a few years before the 14th Amendment was ratified, extending political rights to black men, but quite specifically denying them to black women and white women by introducing the word male into the Constitution for the first time. And I want to just situate Sanger's, the story of her life, in the context of emerging constitutional arguments about who whose rights are protected in the Constitution. So just to remind you, Sanger's born in 1879. She's born in upstate New York. She and her sister, Ethel, somehow this, this is not working either. Thanks. Uh, Margaret and her sister, Ethel, uh, were the children of a man who carved tombstones, including a lot of tombstones for infants. Their mother was pregnant 18 times in 22 years and died at the age of 44. Margaret, as a young girl of eight, delivered one of her siblings. She decided she wanted to become a doctor. So did her sister, Ethel. But Ethel got pregnant at the age of 18. And when she came to deliver that child, Margaret came and delivered Ethel Byrne's first child, Jack, in 1902. Olive Byrne, Margaret Sanger's niece, was born in 1904. She was delivered by Margaret Sanger. This was Ethel Byrne's second child. And the story of Olive Byrne's birth was really important in the history of the birth control movement in this country because when Ethel Byrne delivered this child, Olive Byrne, when Margaret Sanger was there at the delivery, Ethel Byrne's husband, Jack, came back from a saloon down the street and was irate at the baby's crying, grabbed the baby, and threw the baby out the door into a snowbank. Whereupon, Margaret Sanger went outside, fetched the baby back in, and saved Olive Byrne's life. This story, as Sanger tells it and as Ethel Byrne tells it, is a great deal of how Margaret Sanger came to believe in the urgent need for birth control. At a time when other women were fighting for the right to vote, Margaret Sanger and her sister Ethel Byrne became convinced that the more urgent need was the right for contraception. Sanger was married and had two children of her own at this time. Ethel Byrne decided to leave her children and move to New York to live with her sister to train as a nurse. She lied about being married and having children. She said she was single. You couldn't train as a nurse if you were married. And she trained as a nurse here at Mount Sinai. It is Ethel Byrne who, with Margaret Sanger in 1913, wrote What Every Girl Should Know, a guide to contraception that was banned on grounds of obscenity, uh, leading to the publication of this broadside about the nature of obscenity laws. When Ethel Byrne and Margaret Sanger were living together in Greenwich Village, they were swept up in the early feminist movement, which distinguished itself from the suffrage movement of the 19-teens by arguing for political equality uh, in all realms of life for equality of education, for equality of political representation, for equality in the arts, for marriage equality, uh, and for equal rights much more broadly than the suffrage campaign urged. One of the most important illustrators of this early feminist movement is this woman, Annie Lucasta Rogers, who published under the name of Lou Rogers, who was a cartoonist whose cartoons, whose political cartoons, whose editorial cartoons, made some rather sweeping constitutional arguments that are relevant to our conversation today. Here's Lou Rogers urging her own particular ideas about how to save Washington, that is, how to reinterpret the word persons in the Constitution in such a way as it would embrace women. As, as Sanger and her sister were working towards birth control in the 19-teens, suffragists managed finally to have success in arguing for the right to vote. Here, Carrie Chapman Catt reflecting on how long it had taken women to get that word male out of the Constitution. Sanger and her sister, though, insisted again and again that the right to vote would not bring political equality to women, that the right to, that the political equality could only come in consequence of the uh, overturning of obscenity laws that prevented the conversations even between doctors and their patients about contraception. In The Woman Rebel, Sanger and Byrne coined the term birth control in 1914. 
They opened the clinic together in 1960, and again, the two of them were the two nurses who ran the clinic. Sanger wrote that she had, she had decided to open this birth control clinic partly, she, really, to get arrested, but also because in her experience as a nurse and in Ethel Byrne's experience as well, doomed women consistently implored her to reveal the secret that rich people had. One study conducted in New York at the time that found that 41% of women who received medical thick care through free health clinics in the city, operated by the Department City of Public Health, had never used contraception, but of those, more than half had had at least one abortion. They averaged two apiece. What, what Sanger and Byrne wanted to do was to provide abortion, to, prov to provide contraception um, at their clinic in 1916. <clears throat> We celebrate this anniversary as the anniversary of Margaret Sanger's trial, but in fact, when an undercover policewoman came to their clinic in the fall of 1916, Margaret Sanger wasn't there. Ethel Byrne was the nurse on call, and she's the one who discussed contraception with the undercover policeman who came that day. And she is, in fact, the woman who was tried first in January of 1917. Margaret Sanger, we'll hear more about today, was kind of a piece of work as a human, be as a human being. <laughs> Let me just say, um, one of the most interesting stories that I ever came across with regard to the relationship between Margaret Sanger and Ethel Byrne is that much later in their lives, uh, many of you I'm sure have heard of Margaret Sanger, but many of you have never heard of Ethel Byrne. One of the reasons for that, <laughs> That is that is uh, well, is that Sanger carried forth the work that Byrne left, but also Sanger quite specifically was interested uh, in representing herself as the woman who had been engaged in this particular struggle more thoroughly than her sister had been. When uh, a Hollywood filmmaker tried to buy the rights to Margaret Sanger's autobiography in the 1950s, um, Sanger wrote her sister a letter and said he would like. Um, I, we would like your permission to represent that I was the one who went on a hunger strike after I was sent to jail in 1917. <laughs> Ethel Byrne refused to sign it. That's why there was no uh, biopic of Margaret Sanger. <laughs> in any case, Ethel Byrne was tried first. She's, she's the one who uh, discussed contraception in violation of a New York penal code and uh, federal obscenity laws in 1917. And when she went to trial, her lawyer said that contraception was covered under a woman's right to the pursuit of happiness. This was a political, a constitutional argument that didn't fly with the court. She was sentenced to prison. And an imitation, and inspired by Emmeline Pankhurst and the great British suffragettes, uh, suffragists of the, of the 19 teens, she went on a hunger strike. Uh, she was forcibly fed. And her condition, including her vital signs, signs, were reported in newspapers across the country day after day after day. It was the most important news story in the early winter of 1917, the hunger strike of Ethel Byrne. She was at that time the most famous woman in the United States. She was the first woman, first woman to go on a hunger strike, the first woman to be forcibly fed. Margaret Sanger uh, in order to secure sympathy for her sister, went on a trip to upstate New York to Rochester to visit the orphanage where Olive Byrne was living, to tell Olive Byrne that her mother was about to die. No one had known that Ethel Byrne had children. She had not herself seen them in many years. Olive had grown up in a Catholic, in a, in a, in a Catholic orphanage. What, the reason that Ethel Byrne is a person whose name you do not know is that while Margaret Sanger was in upstate New York. She met with the governor of New York in Albany and made a deal with him. Uh, the governor at Sanger, the way Sanger tells the story, the governor asked that Ethel Byrne never again be involved in the birth control movement and if she would pledge that or if Sanger would pledge on her sister's behalf, she would be pardoned and released. Sanger, fearing her sister was about to die, agreed to this arrangement. One wonders, though, if Sanger really just did wish her sister to be no longer involved in the birth control movement. In any case, she made this arrangement on her sister's behalf, essentially, essentially silencing her sister from any further political activity, much to her sister's great consternation. In any case, that's why Ethel Byrne is not the name that you have heard. Sanger was then tried during her trial. Uh, at one point, the judge waged, waved a cervical cap from the bench. I think a first in American jurisprudence. <laughs> Sanger had hoped to argue that the law preventing the distribution of contraception was constitutional because it exposed women against their will to the danger of dying in childbirth and therefore violated a woman's constitutional right to life. This right to life argument did not sit well with the judge, 
uh, although he did allow that doctors could prescribe contraception, which is what it made it possible subsequently for Sanger to open more clinics. But he did, in his opinion, rule that the right to copulate with the feeling of security that there will be no resulting con conception was not a right. That if a woman is not willing to die in childbirth, she should not have sex. That was what marked the end of the right to life argument, which was otherwise a really interesting constitutional argument to make in favor of reproductive rights. From the start, the reproductive rights movement has been as much about fighting these kinds of legal battles and also political battles, as much about that as it has been about staffing clinics, because in a country for most of its history without national health care, making contraception available to poor women has required legal reform. That led Sanger, who continued the movement, leaving her sister behind, to engage in different kinds of activities and to attempt to make different political and legal arguments. She founded the Birth Control Review. Havelock Ellis, the British sexologist, began making an argument about what were sometimes called the erotic rights of women as, a, as effectively a constitutional right. Sanger sometimes did acknowledge her sister and her sister's contributions to the movement here in 1920. Uh, a book that Sanger published the year that the 19th Amendment was finally ratified, promising the guarantee of the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. This did not, for Sanger, end the argument, nor did it end the constitutional argument that women had hoped to make all along. Alice Paul introduced the Equal Rights Amendment into Congress in 1923 for the first time. Men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States. Sanger's Birth Control Review uh, engaged in a kind of uh, editorial iconography that drew from the suffrage movement, which itself had derived from the abolitionist movement, and used images of bondage to talk about women's relationship to childbearing. This has great importance when we get later to the story of Wonder Woman, but I want to take another detour back and check up on Olive Byrne, since she's really kind of, in some ways, the quiet hero of this story. Um, Margaret Sanger married a very wealthy man, and Ethel Byrne said to her sister, the one thing you need to do for me is send my daughter to college. Ethel Byrne had no money, and um, she wanted her daughter to become a doctor. So with, all of, for, with Margaret Sanger's money, Olive Byrne went to Tufts University, Tufts University in 1923, where her aim was to become a doctor. Here she is with her sorority. She's the one with the headband on. She's the cute in the front row with the adorable little headband. Um, she was a sex radical, Olive Byrne. She dressed as a boy for much of her time at Tufts. Um, she also, uh, she was, uh, she founded the Liberal Club. She was voted by her class to be the cleverest and wisest and most unusual student at Tufts. She also worked at Margaret Sanger's birth control clinic at New York, in New York during Christmas and summer vacations, and she supplied the women of Tufts College with birth control. She also invited Margaret Sanger to speak on campus, uh, and the Tufts administration decided Sanger should not be allowed to speak on campus, which was common at the time. While Olive Byrne was at Tufts, she met the man in this picture, who was a professor of psychology, William Moulton Marston. Here's Olive Byrne at her graduation with her professor, William Moulton Marston. She was his research assistant and his lover. Uh, here she is with um, mother on the right, is Ethel Byrne, who's come up for graduation. And on the left is EHM, Elizabeth Holloway Marston. That's Marston's wife. <laughs> Marston um, w was a, uh, a professor of psychology and of legal psychology, had an undergraduate and two graduate degrees from, uh, from we somehow shouldn't be there yet, from Harvard. Um, he believed he was himself a sex radical, and he and his wife, who had been a suffragist and was an ardent feminist, decided that they and Olive Byrne would live together as a threesome and raise their children together, I think somewhat to the consternation of Ethel Byrne, who wanted her daughter to become a doctor. Uh, Olive Byrne and Margaret, uh, Olive Byrne, Margaret Sanger's niece, and William Moulton Marston, that professor, and Elizabeth Holloway Marston then had four children together. Uh, and here they are at Ethel Byrne's house on Cape Cod, where they summered with Margaret Sanger and Ethel Byrne, who both summered on Cape Cod. Margaret Sanger and Ethel Byrne were essentially the grandparents, the grandmothers of the children in this family. 
Sanger, uh, while all this was going on with her sister's family, continued her work, sent, turning to political lobbying to try to advance the cause of, of uh, women's reproductive rights. In 1926, she and her colleagues went to Washington and met with 60 senators, 20 congressmen, and 17 members of the Judiciary Committee, urging them to repeal the federal Comstock law, uh, which deemed any discussion of contraception to be uh, an obscenity. A smart tactic in these political lobbying arguments was that devised by Mary Ware Dennett of the Voluntary Parenthood League. When she lobbied the New York State Legislature in 1924, she pointed out that the very law uh, who the, the men in the legislature refused to change was the laws their wives clearly had broken. She calculated that congressional families had an average of 2.7 fam 2.7 children. This argument didn't make much headway. Senator James Reed of Missouri told Sanger and her lobbyists that he believed that birth control is chipping away at the very foundation of our civilization. In support of her cause, Sanger in the 1920s did indeed court eugenicists. At one point, Sanger's American Birth Control League even proposed a merger with the American Eugenics Society. Importantly, though, the society was not interested. Sanger was unpopular with eugenicists in the 1920s because her background was in socialism, and eugenicists were much more commonly laissez-faire conservatives, which is among the many reasons that Sanger in the 1920s was increasingly at odds with her own organization. A survey conducted of 1,000 members of the American Birth Control League in 1927 found that its membership was disproportionately Republican from small towns and suburbs and Rotarians. Sanger actually at that time was forced out of the American Birth Control League, which objected to her feminism. During the Depression, when more and more people were interested in having fewer and fewer children, Gallup polls found that three out of four Americans supported the legalization of contraception. So did most religious denominations. Uh, and in 1937, a federal appellate court heard a case in which um, uh, they removed contraception from the category of obscenity. Not long after that, the American Birth Control League merged with Sanger's Clinical Research Bureau here in New York to become the Birth Control Federation of America. It then changed its name in 1942 to become the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, a change that Sanger very much regretted. The loss of the term birth control in the title of the organization was to her a concession to um, its much more conservative goals by the 1940s. During all this time, uh, Margaret Sanger's family's ties to this family with its extraordinary family arrangement were entirely hidden. Olive Byrne in the 1930s wrote for Family Circle magazine, which is really the best part about the whole story. <laughs> She would write these stories where she would pretend that she was going to visit world-famous consulting psychologist William Moulton Marston to ask him for advice about her children and how to raise them and how to teach them how to tell the truth. <laughs> I think they all thought that it was very funny, too. Um, 1942, the year that uh, Margaret Sanger's Birth Control League became the Planned Parented Federation of America, is also the year that Wonder Woman got her own comic book. Wonder Woman was created by William Moulton Marston, Olive Byrne's common law husband, um, and is often a, was attributed to him uh, in the first issue of the regular uh, comic book Wonder Woman, featuring the men behind Wonder Woman, <laughs> as if the comic book had been created by men. But I want to argue and remind you that Wonder Woman actually was created as much by Margaret Sanger and Ethel Byrne and Olive Byrne and Elizabeth Holloway Marston and Lou Rogers and Carrie Chapman Catt and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Alice Paul as she was created by anyone else. The feminism in Wonder Woman as Marston represented it is the feminism uh, and suffragism of the early 19-teens when he was coming of age and when he was influenced by these writers, writers. The comic book is full of heterodoxy feminism. Wonder Woman's origin story is taken out of uh, a short story by Charlotte Perkins Gilman called Her Land, uh, a land all of all women, of Amazonian women who live without men and who therefore have no need for birth control. This was Charlotte Perkins Gilman's <laughs> solution to the problem. Uh, Wonder Woman comes from Paradise Island. It's called Paradise Island because there are no men there. And um, Marston just took that story that was very much inspired by the feminism of the 19-teens that was the feminism that was very much part of his 
story. Wonder Woman is always chained up in the early stories written by Marston in order to break free. Marston said the whole point of having her chained up was so that she could emancipate herself. Uh, that is a conceit that is taken from Lou Rogers' feminist cartoons of the 19-teens. Wonder Woman was also drawn by a man named Harry G. Peter, who was a colleague of Lou Rogers at Judge Magazine. They both wrote, uh, they, they both drew illustrations for the suffrage page of many different magazines. They were staff artists together. So Wonder Woman essentially revisits the feminist and suffrage iconography and birth control movement iconography of the 19-teens and 20s and updates it with a kind of Betty Grable airbrushed... Uh, <laughs> pinup girl eroticism. Wonder, Woman's com Wonder Woman comics actually draw very heavily from the iconography, especially the political iconography of the feminist movement and especially of the reproductive rights movement of the 19-teens. She's always dragging around balls, <laughs> balls and chains. Um, there are also some kind of little sort of very clever visual cues and jokes about Sanger. Uh, that help a reader who was paying attention, although this would have been very difficult for the eight-year-old boy who was reading Wonder Woman in 1943, to see that Wonder Woman really is Margaret Sanger. She's inspired by Margaret Sanger. In her particular kind of political struggle, she's fighting for women's rights. She has come to the United States from Paradise Island to fight for the equality of women, and she will not be silenced. This is a very famous photograph of Margaret Sanger when she was told she couldn't speak in Boston, and she had herself photographed. She stood on stage wearing a gag. During the Second World War, Planned Parenthood uh, touted family, controlling family size as part of the war effort. Birth control during the war continued to gain religious support. Marston, William Moulton Marston, who created Wonder Woman, died in 1947. His widow argued that she and the rest of the family, meaning Olive Byrne, ought to be able to take over the writing of Wonder Woman, but um, DC Comics disagreed and hired different writers, and Wonder Woman went uh, into a, a period of considerable decline in the late 1940s and 1950s. So really, in some ways, did Planned Parenthood, which became in the 1950s interested in population control and was one run almost exclusively by men. Barry Goldwater served on the board of Planned Parenthood of Phoenix. Uh, by 1956, Sanger, who had retired to Tucson, wrote to the national director of Planned Parenthood, if I told you or wrote you that the name Planned Parenthood would be, at the, end, would be the end of the movement, it, has, it was and has proven true. The movement, when I started, was a fighting forward, no fooling movement, battling for the freedom of the poorest parents and for women's biological freedom and development. The Planned Parenthood Federation has left all of this behind. Birth control in the first half of the 20th century was a liberal reform, often turned to conservative ends. Elizabeth Mars Elizabeth Marston, William Moulton Marston's widow, and Olive Byrne lived together for the rest of their lives after Marston died in 1947. They'd finished raising their children, and they moved to Tucson in the 1950s to take care of Margaret Sanger as she was ailing. Olive Byrne became Margaret Sanger's private secretary. She also organized her papers, um, and I think she may very well have taken out many references to her mother in those papers due to her own conflicted relationship with Ethel Byrne. The most notable court case in the, right before Margaret Sanger's death in 1966 in the advancement of the reproductive rights cause was Griswold versus Connecticut in 1965 when Esther Griswold, Estelle Griswold, who ran the Planned Parenthood uh, Clinic in Connecticut, had her case brought all the way to the Supreme Court, which decided that Comstock... Uh, little Comstock laws across the states that banned the discussion of contraception as a form of obscenity were unconstitutional. The argument in, in the Griswold case is really different from the constitutional argument that had been made in Sanger and Burns trials in 1917 and in any cases that had come in between. Remember that Burns' lawyer argued that the right to contraception was protected under a right to the pursuit of happiness and Sanger's lawyer had argued that the right to contraception was protected under a right to life. In Griswold versus Connecticut, the argument that worked was an argument about the right to privacy. And this is the right that was established and on which 
reproductive rights cases stand ever since. It's not actually the argument that women who were making the case politically chose. It was an argument that was essentially chosen and preferred by the court. And interestingly, one of the things about the right to privacy, uh, as, as fascinating and as crucial it has become in many realms of American life, not least technological surveillance, the right to privacy as an idea emerges at the end of the 19th century um, as part of a set of cultural preferences about women needing to be unseen and women existing outside political outside the political sphere. In other words, the right to privacy has a lot in common with the Comstock laws that deemed contraception obscenity in the first place. So it is, an, is essentially a, a very difficult uh, limb to stand on to make this argument, but the argument worked. One of the most joyful moments I've ever had in an archive was um, sitting in the uh, uh, bedroom of Byrne Holloway Marston, the youngest child of Willie Moulton Marston, Olive Byrne, and Elizabeth Holloway Marston. He's a retired obstetrician, and he has all of his uh, mother's papers. And he had this letter that she wrote to William Douglas after the decision in 1965 in Griswold versus Connecticut. In 1966, the year after this case, Alan Guttmacher, an obstetrician who'd become head of Planned Parenthood in 1962, testified before Congress, we really have the opportunity now, that is in the wake of this ruling, to extend free choice in family planning to all Americans, regardless of social status, and to demonstrate to the rest of the world how it can be done. In 1969, it was Richard Nixon who asked Congress to increase federal funding for family planning. In the House, Texas Congressman George H.W. Bush said, we need to make family planning a household word. We need to take the sensationalism out of the topic so it can no longer be used by militants. Nixon signed Title, X, Title X into law in 1970. No American woman should be denied access to family planning assistance because of her economic condition, Nixon said then. The case for abortion was something that Planned Parenthood came to with some reluctance in the 1960s. It had first been brought up in 1955 by the medical director, Mary Calderon. In 1967, Guttmacher edited a book called The Case for Legalized Abortion. Um, much of the agitation for abortion rights in the 1960s, though, came from not from women, but from, from doctors and from lawyers. Between 1967 and 1970, restriction, restrictions on abortions were lifted by legislatures in many states. In 1970, the National Clergy Consultation Service, established to help women find doctors who could conduct abortions safely, offered services in 26 states. Women, though, weren't very much part of this movement. Betty Friedan endorsed the liberalization of abortion laws at a meeting of now in 1966. But women's rights activists only began to join this effort in 1969, the year NARA was founded. In a speech in Chicago that year, Friedan said, there is no freedom, no equality, no full human dignity and personhood possible for women until we assert and demand the control over our own bodies and our own reproductive processes. Curiously, this is just at the moment where Wonder Woman makes a revival. <laughs> Uh, women who had grown up with Wonder Woman in the 1940s and 50s, when they entered the women's movement and when the women's movement uh, took the form of the women's liberation movement in the 1960s, they adopted Wonder Woman as their icon. Uh, Wonder Woman, this is an appearance, an Edward Sorrell cartoon in, in uh, New York Magazine where Gloria Steinem was on staff from 1969, um, where Wonder Woman is fighting smug liberals and rapists. Um, Women cartoonists also looked back to the cartoons and the comic books of the 1930s and began trying to find a tradition that they could, they could update and rewrite. This is just my favorite example of the use of Wonder Woman in women's, the women's liberation movement. This is a comic book called It Ate Me Babe that was published in Berkeley by the feminist underground press. And on the cover are all these uh, comic book heroes from the 1930s, Sheena the Jungle Queen and Olive Oil and Little Lulu. Uh, you see marching there, she started in 1935, and, and of course Wonder Woman. And inside, there's a whole storyline about how all these comic book characters break out of their stock plots. And a, it's a comic panel called Breaking Out. And, and the best of them is this one where little Lulu um, is mad because Iggy um, is having a parade and no girls are allowed. And on hearing that, little Lulu does something a little bit different than she would have done in 1935. She wonders for a moment, and, and then in a panel that I think evokes everything about the women's movement in 1970, makes this decision. <laughs> I think the 
these people really need to produce some t-shirts? <laughs> the time has come. <laughs> I do actually have a t-shirt with this on, but I'm too embarrassed to wear it outside the house. It's just like, I wear it at home on like really bad writing days. Um, in any case, Steinem decided in 1972 to put Wonder Woman on the cover of Ms. Magazine. This is the year Shirley Chisholm was running for the Democratic nomination for president. Wonder Woman is here running for president. Steinem actually wrote to Elizabeth Holloway Marston and asked her to come to New York to the offices of Ms. Magazine to really give her blessing. And, 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 and Holloway Marston came up and, and visited and did give her blessing, was really excited to see Wonder Woman's revival. In the first issue of Ms., this first regular issue of Ms. Magazine, there's a four-page pull-out section that is the original Wonder Woman from 1941. So this incredible gesture to the, to the, to, uh, toward the feminist origins of this popular culture icon. But Elizabeth Holloway Marston, all this time, all these decades, the family story, the tie between Wonder Woman and Margaret Sanger and reproductive rights and the birth control movement was completely invisible because it was a family secret. Marston had lost his job at Columbia and had been, as, a, as an academic, he'd been blacklisted from academia in the same way that homosexuals were blacklisted from academia in the 1920s and 30s and 40s and beyond. Marston was blacklisted for his sexual arrangements. Sanger knew that if it got out that this, <laughs> this character was tied to her, that would have been fine. M that Wonder Woman was inspired by Margaret Sanger would have been fine, but that the t way in which M Sanger's family was tied to Marston's family would not have been fine. It would have really undermined the movement, it would have associated it with sex radicalism at a time, especially when the more conservative uh, leadership of Planned Parenthood uh, would have been deeply alarmed by any such revelation. Even in the 1970s, though, the family secret was such an important secret within the family, and it had become so important to the family to not reveal the family story that when Elizabeth Holloway Marston came to New York and met with Gloria Steinem, she made no mention of Margaret Sanger or Ethel Byrne or Olive Byrne. Uh, that was not the story that she told, and that's not the story that became part of the feminist movement. Nevertheless, in my second favorite all-time Wonder Woman <laughs> comment, this is a, um, a 1973 newsletter from a women's health collective in L.A. Uh, where Wonder Woman is wielding a speculum. Um, insider instructions on how to conduct a vaginal self-exam. And um, there's this incredible use of Wonder Woman, especially in a kind of underground comic sense or in the growing women's health movement, where Wonder Woman does all kind of work. Meanwhile, though, of course, Abortion has come to the national stage in the, in the arguments made before the Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade, where um, Jane Roe's lawyer, Sarah Weddington, is really willing to pretty much make any possible constitutional <laughs> argument that would work, as you can see here. But the court's preference is for the right to privacy claim that has been established by Griswold v. Connecticut. Um, Nine months after Roe, Gutmecker descri describes, tells the story of showing up at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston to give a lecture, only to be confronted by protesters wearing hospital scrubs spattered with red paint, crying murder. And in some way, there begins the political battles over abortion that are the long aftermath of Roe, beginning in 1973. But as Linda Greenhouse and Reva Siegel have argued, what happened after Roe wasn't a consequence of the court's ruling. It was, in fact, a consequence of Republican strategists' attempt to redefine the party around this issue even before the decision was made by the court. In 1969, in the emerging Republican majority, Nixon strategist Kevin Phillips offered a blueprint for crushing the Democrats' New Deal coalition by recruiting Southerners and Catholics to the GOP. At the time, prominent de Democrats, including Edward Kennedy, were vocally opposed to abortion. Nixon's advisors urged him to reconsider his position on abortion and family planning. In 1960, the year he'd signed Title X, Nixon had ruled that doctors on military bases could perform abortions. In 1971, though, Patrick Buchanan wrote him a memo recommending that the president reverse that position as part of a strategy to ensure that George McGovern, the candidate Nixon wanted to run against, would defeat Edward Muskie for the Democratic nomination. Observing that abortion was a rising issue and a gut issue with Catholics, Buchanan advised Nixon to publicly reverse the Department of Defense decision. Buchanan wrote, if the president should publicly take his stand against abortion as offensive to his own moral principles, then we can force Muskie to make the choice between his tens of millions of Catholic supporters and his liberal friends at the New York Times and the Washington Post. 
A week later, Nixon issued a statement to the Department of Defense reversing his position and borrowing the language of the Catholic Church to speak of his personal belief in the sanctity of human life, including the life of the yet unborn. It's this turn, as Greenhouse and, and, and Siegel argue, uh, that makes everything that comes afterward make sense. Favoritism toward things Catholic is good politics, a Nixon, a Nixon strategist wrote in Dividing the Democrats, a memo to H.R. Haldeman in 1971. There is a trade-off, but it leaves us with the larger share of the pie. Nixon supporters balked at this suggestion, but Buchanan held firm. Asked whether Nixon might perhaps go back to his original position, Buchanan said that would be stupid. He will cost himself Catholic support and gain what? Betty Friedan? <clears throat> Nevertheless, Wonder Woman had an answer for this problem. <laughs> uh, it's fascinating to me just how, if you go back and look at political pamphlets from the 1970s, just how prevalent Wonder Woman is in a particular kind of politics that we now associate with liberal feminism. Um, this became uh, mainstreamed in 1975 when Linda Carter began playing Wonder Woman in a fairly popular television show that you may even remember the theme song of. People remember this? So this would, turned out to be really bad for Gloria Steinem. <laughs> um, because one of the things that the mainstream of Wonder Woman did was to really illustrate the divide between liberal feminists and radical feminists who came to associate Steinem with Wonder Woman, with the idea that a single woman needed to behave like a superhero to overcome all obstacles to her own self-actualization, rather than that a collective group of women needed to fight in a common struggle together to change laws and to change politics. Um, this critique of liberal feminism really divided the feminist movement, but it also, uh, at a time when the feminist movement was also suffering from this new onslaught that was coming from the right with regard to the politics of abortion. There's a really deep critique of liberal feminism at the time. Sanger continues to be a controversial figure here, associated with both with birth control. You may notice she's, she's leaping off of a trampoline that's actually a diaphragm. Um, and dressed as Wonder Woman. <laughs> Nevertheless, any, you know, these fam the family story about the Marstons and Olive Byrne and Ethel Byrne is not part of this conversation. Sanger might be dressed up as Wonder Woman, but those more direct ties are unknown. Um, at the time in the 1970s, Planned Parenthood and the reproductive rights movement more broadly is being challenged by the right, but also by the left, especially over the racial history of the organization. Planned Parenthood had organized a National Negro Advisory Committee in 1940, black doctors and nurses and public health officials who wanted to reduce maternal death and infant mortality. Rates had um, gone out into communities. Uh, Alan Guttmecker had hoped to strengthen those alliances. In 1962, he sent the director of a clinic to Harlem um, of a clinic in Harlem. The Harlem Clinic had actually been presided over its opening by W.E.B. Du Bois when it first opened. Um, he sent the Harlem Clinic director to meet with Malcolm X, and in fact, it was Malcolm X who suggested that Planned Parenthood ought to call it service family planning instead of birth control. Uh, the meeting notes, were, which are at the Smith College Library, read, his reason for this was that people, particularly Negroes, would be more willing to plan than to be controlled gives some sense of the hostility and the tension between uh, the civil rights movement and what was then um, Planned Parenthood. Um, in 1967, after a leader of the Pittsburgh branch of the NAACP called Planned Parenthood a racist project, the chairman of the national organization said that the NAACP supported family planning, but in 1968, Planned Parenthood clinics in Cleveland were set on fire. So this is extraordinary tension that's coming both from the left and from the right by the 1970s, and much of it centers increasingly on the character of Sanger herself. Meanwhile, GOP strategists are recruiting Jerry Falwell into a coalition designed to bring together economic and social conservatives around what comes to be called a pro-family agenda, one that targets gay rights, sexual freedom, women's liberation, the ERA, child care, and sex education. They believed that abortion ought to be the key of their organizing strategy, since this was the issue that could divide the Democratic Party. Falwell founded the Moral Majority in 1979. That's a year after this illustration. Uh, although in 1982, the founder of the American Life League scoffed, Falwell couldn't spell abortion five years ago. 
it's this movement of this, this new alliance of Catholics and evangelicals and the partisan, the, the, essentially the making of abortion as a partisan issue that reconfigures the Republican Party. Republican strategists say at this time in the 1980s that it's not a problem to lose white women. White women then at this era are fleeing the Republican Party and joining the Democratic Party. It's not a problem to lose white women, Republican strategists say, because we gain so many more white men. In 1983, Planned Parenthood opens a legal department to fight what becomes an increasing number uh, and complexity of legal challenges to abortion rights. You'll hear today in the panels to come about the subsequent decades of those legal battles and the changing coalitions behind them. The Women's March in Washington took no particular notice of this anniversary, uh, the anniversary that is of the trial of Ethel Byrne and then the subsequent trial of Margaret Sanger, uh, but there is a sense of history that animates this movement and continues to animate this movement, and I think it's an important one. Uh, this conference is a great occasion to look both forward and backward, and me, I'm struck by the revival of Wonder Woman again at just this moment. Why in 2017 is the first Wonder Woman <laughs> movie coming out? It's a really interesting question to me. What is it about images of female power that have a kind of force in our political culture uh, and in our visual culture today in a different way? For all the flaws of liberal feminism, Wonder Woman remains an icon, having changed a great deal since Amazonian women were first tied into ropes that they broke free from during the suffrage and feminist movements of the 19-teens uh, to this representation. I brought a trailer for the new Wonder Woman film, but I don't know if do people want to see that. Yeah. Okay, so I want you, I want you to ask you. So this new Wonder Woman film, there's never, there's been a lot of Batman films. Okay, there've been too many Batman films. <laughs> I think arguably a few too many Superman films, but there's never been a Wonder, Wonder Woman film. And really, there was only that TV show in the 1970s. So this is a lot of anticipation about this film. And one of the things I was really curious about when I heard that the film was going to be made, it's coming out in June. Who would Wonder Woman fight? So here you get to see. <coughs> You're a man. Well, I mean, do I look like that? Diana. I do not deserve you. Have you never met a man before? I mean, what about your father? I had no father. I was brought to life by Zeus. Well, that's neat. Sorry, there's another something. Sorry, here. Even um, 
even Captain America, who's frozen in time and defrosted, frozen in time in 1940 when he was created and then defrosted in the modern movies, gets to live in the modern world. But Wonder Woman can fight Nazis. Like, who is the feminist going to fight, <laughs> fight that would make a palatable movie? It's a really interesting question. So I'm very curious to see what the film actually looks like, but I'm fascinated by the idea that the fight that Wonder Woman was brought to fight is over, and that that fight uh, has to happen in the 1940s. So I just want to close by returning to the constitutional arguments with which I began. Remember, we talked about the 14th Amendment and its ratification not very many years before Margaret Sanger was born. As you know, that one of the more interesting uh, constitutional propositions in recent decades has been the argument for a human life amendment to the Constitution, which generally reads, the term person or persons shall include every human being from the moment of fertilization. These amendments haven't generally passed. Uh, uh, the conversation about them is quite muted at the moment, although that would, that would change if... Um, Vice President Pence assumes the presidency at some point, since this is an important position that he holds. Um, but I want to—I want to begin. I want to end my remarks with a challenge for the conversations to come today. If a fertilized egg has constitutional rights, women cannot have equal rights with men. They cannot have the same rights. They can have the different rights, but they therefore cannot have equal rights with men. That is a conundrum. But this is, I think, what, exactly what no one wants to talk about because it's complicated. And in the last century, it's proven easier, surprisingly easy, really, when you think about it, to use this issue instead to simple political advantage. Democrats and Republicans thrust and parry and parry and thrust in a battle that gives every appearance of having been going on forever, going nowhere, and unlikely to end anytime soon. But that is an illusion. Neither abortion nor birth control is by nature a partisan issue. And from the vantage of the last century, which position is conservative and which is liberal, is actually rather difficult to sort out. Not least because this debate, which rages at a time when there is very little consensus on what makes a person a person, this debate began before an American electorate of white men was able to agree that a woman had a status as a citizen any different from that of a child. The terms of this debate were set a hundred years ago and more. It is time to change those terms. Thank you. Thank you so much for that stimulating talk, Jill. It was fantastic. Uh, we'll take a tiny break while we're mucking up our panel, and uh, we'll reconvene here in about two minutes.
if you would if you would please uh, begin to take your seats again we are about ready to begin our first panel of the morning I don't know. I have no idea. We're ready now to start our first panel. Welcome back. And uh, please, if you would remember to silence your cell phones or anything that makes noise, we'd appreciate it. Our first discussion, The Legacy of Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood at 100, will explore what we can learn from Margaret Sanger's extraordinary career. There will be people, by the way, distributing cards on which you can write your questions, which we'll collect for a Q&A towards the end of the panel. Uh, and here are its panelists. Linda Gordon is University Professor of Humanities and History at New York University. For the first part of her career, she wrote about the historical roots of social policy debates in the US, publishing three prize-winning books in a row, The Moral Property of Women, The History of Birth Control Politics, Heroes of Their Own Lives About Family Violence, and Pitied But Not Entitled, Single, Women, Single Mothers and the History of Welfare. She is a two-time Bancroft Award winner, making her one of three authors ever to win it twice. Her most recent book is Feminism Unfinished, A Short Surprising History of the 20th Century Women's Movements. Her book on the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s will be published later this year. Adam Cohen is a former member of the New York Times editorial board and former senior writer for Time magazine. A journalist and lawyer, he is also the author of four books, Imbeciles, The Supreme Court, American Eugenics, and The Sterilization of Carrie Buck, Nothing to Fear, FDR's Inner Circle and the Making of Modern America, The Perfect Sh Store, Inside eBay, and American Pharaoh, Richard J. Daly, His Battle for Chicago and the Nation. He's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School, where he was president of the Harvard Law Review. Iris Lopez, who was originally announced for this panel, sustained a serious injury a few weeks ago, and unfortunately, is not well enough to participate today. But Dorothy Roberts, from our second panel, is graciously stepping in to pinch hit. <laughs> uh, she is uh, the 14th Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor and George A. Weiss University Professor of Law and Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania with joint appointments in the Departments of Africana Studies and Sociology and the Law School, where she is the inaugural Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Mossell Alexander Professor of Civil Rights. Your, um, your, card is, your business card is probably as long as mine. <laughs> um, she is also founding director of the Penn Program on Race, Science, and so Society, an internationally recognized scholar, public intellectual, and social justice advocate. Roberts has written and lectured extensively on the interplay of race and gender in legal issues and has been a leader in transforming thinking on reproductive health, child welfare, and bioethics. Moderator Ellen Chesler is a senior fellow at the Roosevelt Institute, the longtime partner to the Roosevelt Library in Hyde Park. She is author of the critically celebrated Woman of Valor, Margaret Sanger and the Birth Control Movement in America, co-editor of Where Human Rights Begin, Health, Sexuality, and Women in the New Millennium, and co-editor of Women and Girls Rising, Progress and Resistance Around the World. 
She's written numerous essays and articles in academic and policy anthologies and for major newspapers, periodicals, and blogs, and is at work on a new book about the history of women's rights as fundamental human rights. She's taught history and public policy at Hunter CUNY and Barnard College. She's an honors graduate of Vassar College and holds a PhD in American history from Columbia University. Please join me in welcoming Ellen, Linda, Adam, and Dorothy. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today and um, to follow Jill's wonderful overview, uh, both of Margaret Sanger and of some of the legal and constitutional issues um, that have plagued this movement for over 100 years. It's also special to be here today because this is indeed actually the 100th anniversary of the Sunday in 1917 in which Margaret Sanger was, um, whoop, wrong slides. <laughs> Can you rack up my slides? Button, press, the green button. press the green button, okay. <laughs> there we have Margaret Sanger. Um, was actually released from the Queen's Penitentiary for Women in, um, in New York, uh, having uh, staged her arrest deliberately, as you heard a bit from Jill, I'll try not to repeat, um, to test the laws um, that bore the name of this man, Anthony Comstock, uh, who had been, become the arbiter of uh, morality in this country in the 19th century. Um, at first self-appointed, but then an agent of government. He actually uh, worked for the postal office and was allowed to disrupt mails and make arrests. Um, his principal uh, concern was obscenity, um, that he labeled under the term obscenity and had laws passed in all states and at the federal level um, to, uh, uh, that he could enforce, um, not just obscenity, but virtually um, all sexual speech um, and all sexual commerce, including uh, birth control and uh, abortifacients. Um, Take away his whiskers, and you may see a strange resemblance to the five or six men who were standing behind President Trump when he gleefully signed <laughs> the, uh, the Gogable gag rule back into effect, which will prevent about $600 million in American money from supporting um, contraception globally, uh, a great tragedy, which we can get back to at the end of this panel. Um, and indeed, as Jill talked about, um, what's absolutely clear is that the uh, larger social and economic factors uh, that are driving um, the debate around Planned Parenthood and reproductive freedoms today uh, were pretty identical in the late 19th century um, and were the means through which Comstock captured American politics much as some of the right is capturing it today. Uh, and they were the new emancipation of women in the late 19th century, education of women, um, the emancipation of blacks, the freedom of uh, black Americans, uh, African Americans, and um, the enormous waves of new immigration. So you have you know, tremendous similarities. Very quickly, because we have a panel and I'm not speaking myself today, let me just show you the clinic um, with a sort of uh, this is Margaret Sanger's clinic, which, again, she opened deliberately to, to test a provision of the Comstock Law. She had been twice arrested under the free speech constraints of the Comstock Law, but there was a specific provision in the law, uh, so that you understand this clearly, that allowed for doctors to treat um, syphilis, um, medical exceptions to the law, and she thought she could extend that to women uh, in need of contraception for broadly defined medical purposes. And you'll see um, in these photographs, uh, 454 women lined up. There's a kind of gentility to this poverty, but the poverty in the Brownsville neighborhood was very intense in these years. Um, the ethnicity was different. These were largely Italian and uh, uh, Jewish immigrant women um, than today when it's an African uh, and Na American and immigrant community again. but people of color. Um, the poverty was more genteel, but no less intense. Um, here's, you saw that, Jill's, here's the women lining up at Margaret's trial. Um, 
uh, I actually interviewed the woman who had, that tiny little baby became um, when I did my research on the book in the 1980s. Um, there is Margaret leaving jail, looking rather different. Um, and you can see uh, that a month in any prison takes its toll. Um, Margaret Sanger, uh, I might argue a little bit with Jill, um, was an astonishingly uh, gifted organizer, uh, publicist, agitator. Um, and it was her decision um, to uh, advance this cause um, at any sacrifice. She had also lost one of her own children. She did have Olive, to whom she was very close, but her own daughter had died of, um, uh, under terrible circumstances um, of, as a child, and she wanted to memorialize that child and memorialize her mother, who also died, as you heard, uh, after multiple childbirths um, at the age of 50. Um, she had an astonishing ability to keep at uh, this issue, and for 50 years did. She went to jail in 1967, 1917, died in 1967. Um, having, however, uh, witnessed the internationalization of the movement and leaving what I would argue is the most important institutional legacy of any, perhaps American, but certainly of any American woman in the 20th century, the global family planning movement, um, which today is associated not only with the rights of women, but with the well-being of societies. We know today um, plan family planning is a international human right. Um, it's defined as such uh, in the Convention to Eliminate All Discrimination Against Women, one of the five pillars of human rights implementation at the UN. We know today that uh, giving women contraception is not only the right thing to do, the moral thing to do, but along with all of rights for women, the smart thing to do if we hoped to achieve the goals of American um, and international um, foreign policy, which are development um, and security. Uh, and prosperity. Um, there's a direct link between um, the rights of women to control their own bodies and their own lives and those larger goals. And that, I believe, is the ultimate legacy of Margaret Sanger. When I uh, wrote about her in the 1990s, she had been largely forgotten. When she died in 1967, she was eulogized as a great emancipator. Um, you can see photographs of her uh, later in her life. Um, here she is with the Mexican-American women um, who flocked to the clinic. She founded when she retired to Tucson, as Jill mentioned. Here she is uh, with a nurse working at that clinic. Here she is with um, Prime Minister Nehru of India in the 1950s. Well, we saw this wonderful, we didn't coordinate our slides, a David Levine <laughs> character from uh, the New York Review of Books uh, and another one um, from the same period. Um, the years since Margaret's death, however, uh, have not been nearly as good to her um, as she has become the collateral victim of uh, the wars over reproductive rights and women's rights uh, in this country um, that Jill also, uh, in a in general way, uh, talked about. Um, in 1992, when I wrote my first book, uh, when I wrote, the, when my first book was first published, I should say, um, she had been, as I just said, largely forgotten. But in the years since, quite deliberately, hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent, um, particularly after the Casey decision in the 1992, uh, the Casey decision of the Supreme Court preserved the core, the core of Roe v. Wade, and Bill Clinton was elected the first pro-choice president in the history of, of this country, and there's only been two along with President Obama. Um, along with the uh, violence that has overtaken this movement um, and the degree of, a degree of impunity that has attached to that, we've stood by as clinics have been firebombed, um, clinicians murdered, um, Planned Parenthood's reputation savaged. So has Margaret Sanger's on the internet. Um, when I wrote at first, there was one small pamphlet by a man named George Grant that circulated in mid-America that I remember Molly Ivins, the columnist, sent me. 
Um, but that has turned into a firestorm. Um, and I would argue that history has been hijacked in a very deliberate way for ideological purposes. Um, and as typical, um, the reputation that's been most savage is savaged in this uh, uh, undertaking is, is the woman's, Margaret Sanger's. Um, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into this panel um, uh, and try to explain why on certainly the extreme right and to a lesser extent the left, um, Sanger has been so controversial. The core, of course, is, as you heard from Jill, her um, association with eugenics. Um, I'm going to let some of my panelists dig a little bit deeper into that before I return to um, the stage and try to sort of tie it all together. Uh, what Adam Cohn's most recent and very brilliant and well-reviewed book uh, on the famous trial um, of Buck v. Bell, which um, saw eight of nine Supreme Court justices uh, upholding eugenics sterilization law in the states and unleashing uh, a terror, really, um, of uh, uh, forced sterilizations um, that is one of the uh, great tragedies of American history. Um, what he explains is that this was done in the context of an almost ubiquitous celebration of eugenics in the 1920s. And I've argued that Sanger sort of had no choice but to engage with eugenics and did it from a progressive point of view, which saw eugenics and medicine and science uh, as replacing religion as an arbiter of what should prevail in morality and certainly in reproduction in America. Um, eugenics is trying to under, try, what she underscored was, and many on the left did, um, and in the progressive movement did, was that science would allow people to make judgments about opportunity um, based on merit, not on the color of a person's skin or the ethnic background uh, or their economic background. Um, and of course, in this sense, eugenics' number one legacy, actually, is the IQ test, which has its uh, complications uh, and needs to not be celebrated universally either, but she came from a very different perspective to eugenics. She never wanted any kind of cradle competition between rich or poor or ever uh, any restrictions on immigration or any kind of sense that ability or opportunity should attach to a group, but only to the individual. But that aspect of eugenics was drowned out by the more conservative um, interpretations of it, which led to uh, sterilization laws, to uh, immigration restrictions, and the like. Um, I'm going to ask you to simply give a kind of large sense of the eugenics movement in the 1920s, and if you can, um, your sense of Margaret's role in that movement. Sure. Thank you very much, yeah. Ellen. Yes. Um, so, um, as Ellen mentioned, I come to this from a different perspective than I think many of the people here today, um, not from a reproductive rights perspective or um, a Margaret Sanger perspective, but from a eugenics perspective. And in my book, I do write about this very sad story of Carrie Buck, who was uh, uh, a perfectly, you know, not in any way physically or mentally disabled person who was raped by her, uh, the nephew of her foster mother, was thrown into the colony for epileptics and feeble-minded in Virginia, and they were looking for someone to make the first uh, 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 person sterilized in the state of Virginia, and they chose Carrie Buck. She was sterilized, her, her younger sister was sterilized. Terrible story. And as I was writing the book, I was looking at the larger context of who was uh, on the side of the sterilizers and who was on the side of Carrie Buck. Not many people on Carrie Buck's side, but there were some. The Catholic Church, Catholic lay people were very much opposed to um, sterilization, but also there were some progressives, like the, uh, the, the wonderful governor of Pennsylvania, uh, Samuel Pennypacker, who vetoed a sterilization law and talked about how we can't leave this stuff to the scientists and we need to protect the most vulnerable. So there were, were heroes to this story. Um, Margaret Sanger, I uh, regret to say, was not one of them. Um, 
Um, I know that it's become a political thing, and, and uh, you know there are those who take delight in, in tarring her with the brush of eugenics. I, I do not, but I also think uh, uh, that just uh, you know accuracy and history uh, requires us to say that she wrote some terrible things, and these are not these are not things that she was quoted saying randomly. These are not things that people you know later are imputing to her. These were in her most famous books, um, in the Pivot of Civilization, which she wrote in 1922 probably her best known work. Um, in the end of, in the back of the book, in an appendix, she has principles and aims of the American Birth Control League. And one of the principles she says is, everywhere we see poverty and large families going hand in hand, those least fit to carry on the race are increasingly, are increasing most rapidly. In the aims part of that same appendix, she writes that one of the league's aims is sterilization of the insane and feeble-minded and the encouragement of this operation upon those afflicted with inherited or transmissible diseases with the understanding that sterilization does not deprive the individual of his or her sex expression, but merely renders him incapable of producing children. Um, she published this in 1922, just when the movement to sterilize people like Carrie Buck was gaining force. In that same book, there's an, a chapter called the Cruelty of Charity, which uh, is really a remarkable document read today. Um, uh, in it, she says she opposes philanthropy quite generally, and, uh, um, and particularly the ones that poor people are benefiting from. As she says, my criticism is directed at the failure of, not at the failure of philanthropy, but rather at its success. And she singles out one particular form of charity which, quote, strikes me as being more insidiously injurious than any other. So what is this charity that she was so opposed to? Charity that concerns itself directly with the function of maternity and aims to supply gratis medical and nursing facilities to, as she says, slum mothers. Sanger complains that this charity makes it possible for slum mothers to be visited by nurses and to receive instruction in the hygiene of pregnancy, to be guided in making arrangements for confinements, uh, to be invited uh, to come to a doctor's clinic for examination and supervision. Childbearing, Sanger complains bitterly, is to be made safe. Efforts of this sort, Sanger said, facilitate the function of maternity among the very classes in which the absolute necessity is to discourage it. Sanger states the charity of this sort is perpetuating constantly increasing numbers of defectives, delinquents, and dependents. My criticism, therefore, she writes, is not directed at the failure of philanthropy, but rather its success. This is not the only book, the only work in which she says this. There's another, uh, another article she wrote for the um, Birth Control, Control Review, The Eugenic Value of Birth Control Propaganda, where she talks about a very classic part of the uh, eugenics movement, uh, differential fecundity, the, the fear that the eugenicists had that all the defective people were having many children and the good people were having few. And she says that the most urgent problem for today is how to limit and discourage the overfertility of the mentally and physically defective. So, um, you know, in her defense, I would say, first of all, this was not her focus. Her focus was absolutely birth control. Um, it was uh, not something, she was not a leader of the eugenics movement, but she was one of the people who created the environment in which Carrie Buck and, as Ellen mentioned, 70,000 Americans were sterilized, unable to have children for just completely fictional reasons in most cases. Um, so why is it important to mention this? Well, um, uh, as I've been looking into the whole eugenics movement, one frustration I've had is that those who are responsible don't talk about it. You know, we're, we're having a reawakening on colleges and universities about the role that, that lots of parts of our society played in slavery, not happening with eugenics. Um, uh, uh, my alma mater, Harvard University, was the center of the eugenics movement. The genetics department wrote terrible textbooks that uh, led to people like Harry Buck being sterilized. Harvard has really not acknowledged that. I wrote a piece for Harvard Magazine, it was very nice of them to uh, invite me to do that, which talked about Harvard's role in this, but Harvard has not talked about it. We're one block away from the Museum of Natural History, which was the center of the eugenics movement in many ways. It's where the second International Eugenics Congress took place. Terrible things were said there. I don't know that they've actually you know, confronted this. So as we you know, celebrate Margaret Sanger, which I believe we, we should, and she very much deserves it, I don't think anyone is served by our being being part of that conspiracy of silence and saying that this movement didn't do some bad things related to eugenics. Thank you. Um, I do want to say before I call on Linda, um, who is the preeminent, among the preeminent uh, historians um, of the reform era, the progressive reform era in America, um, and particularly of the role that women played in it. Um, that as I understood those quotes, or at least uh, 
Sanger objected somewhat to the, the maternal health clinics only because they wouldn't include birth control. They, they would take care of mothers, but they wouldn't allow them um, some level of, what she, was, what she was trying to say in that passage was include birth control, and, and of course um, they would not, uh, not, not, not <laughs> coercive birth control, but voluntary That's not what she says here. Control, but, no, that's well, not what she says it, here. It is, in the, it is in the same text, though. Um, I mean, context is everything, and preceding it is exactly those. We quotes. start with the plain letter, the plain words is the first uh, step in interpretation. Yeah, I, the plain words are I'm very. I'm not plain excusing here. her. I, did, I never excuse her in, in the book I wrote, but I, I did try to put it in that context. She was very upset that the Shepherd Towner uh, maternal health clinics would not include any kind of even information at the time, very much like the gag rule now. America doesn't pay for abortions in the United States or elsewhere, but what we constrain with the gag rule is any kind of speech about how to protect yourself from unwanted pregnancy, and that was her concern. Linda, can you uh, place Margaret Sanger in the context of uh, this reform era um, and, and of the conversation about eugenics? Okay, uh, I am gonna take you back historically, but I wanna start uh, by telling you about a, a new, uh, a legislative initiative that may not have hit the major press yet because it illustrates the themes I want to talk about. On Monday last, February 27th, the Texas Senate Committee on State Affairs unanimously passed on a bill into the full Texas Senate uh, that would uh, allow doctors to decide what a pregnant woman is entitled to know about the status of her fetus. Uh, it should be up to the doctor to decide if a pregnant woman sh should know that she's carrying a fetus with severe disabilities, especially if the doctor suspects she might have an abortion. Um, you'll see <laughs> how this relates pretty soon. Uh, I'm going to go back even further. I am going to go back to the 1870s because I think it helps us to understand where Sanger was coming from. In the 1870s, the, what we call the first wave of feminism uh, actually proposed a kind of form of birth control which they called voluntary motherhood, which meant just what it said, that you should only have to be a mother if it was voluntary. The method often shocks people who haven't already read about this. The method they recommended was abstinence from sex, except when you wanted to conceive. Now, that certainly reflects the prudery of that period, but it also reflected something else extremely important, and that is that women should have the right to say no, even in marriage. And I would point out to you that at that time, in the marriage law of virtually all the states, it was uh, either assumed or written that sexual access by the husband was his entitlement, and therefore, for example, the, the idea of a marital, marital rape as a crime was an oxymoron. It couldn't possibly exist. Um, and uh, as we know from what Ellen said, um, by a by little bit later in, in 1873, uh, we got a law that grouped together pornography at every form of birth control and a few other things as obscenities that could not be uh, allowed to travel in interstate commerce. Now, this, this meant finally that uh, one of the major, if not the major form of reproduction control being used in that period of time was abortion, uh, particularly among poorer people. But, by the early 20th century, by Margaret Sanger's period, um, things have changed. Not only is the economic need for birth control much more urgent, but American norms about sex had really changed and had moved away from this Victorian kind of anxiety toward a, a notion that sex is a healthy thing in marriage, even a lot of it. <laughs> so you had a situation in which elite women we're going to Europe getting uh, pessaries or uh, cervical caps, as they were called, from many European clinics. The Europeans were far ahead of us. You could go to a labor union clinic in many states and you could get uh, fitted with a pessary. This created uh, an increasing class double standard in access to, uh, to contraception because a lot of women didn't, ha didn't even have the knowledge, let alone the ability to go and do this. Um, and this 
class double standard, I think, was one of the things that uh, made some leftists begin to see birth control as a really critical issue about equality, inequality in general. Um, it was two particular women who, who, were, who got most publicity for defying the law at the beginning. One was Emma Goldman, as you probably know, who was arrested for passing out leaflets with information about contraception. Uh, but birth control was one, only one of her the issue she wanted to work on, and besides, she was an opponent of, the, of World War I, and she was quickly deported by the United States and out of the picture. Margaret Sanger had, came to it from a slightly different angle and with a very different outcome. She, like Goldman, she was a free speech advocate. Like, um, as Jill explained earlier, she was a sex radical. She was immersed in a community in New York City of avant-garde artists, writers, intellectuals who conducted themselves in most unconventional ways with regard to sex as, many other, as well as many other things. But she was also a member of the Socialist Party and she wrote a regular column for the Socialist Party newspaper in New York. Uh, crucial here is she was also a nurse, and a visiting nurse, and she uh, visited many uh, of the immigrant poor in the slums of New York and she could see firsthand the uh, physical and emotional and economic costs of not having access to reproduction control. Very important in that was that one of her observations and complaints was that many women were so uh, afraid of getting pregnant that they tried to avoid having sex with their husbands, which in turn could be very destructive of their relationships. And this is a very important line in her thinking, this po very positive attitude about sex. Um, so she was going, she became, unlike Goldman, a one-issue person. And she devoted the rest of her life to this one reform, um, uh, birth control, or which quickly became focused on contraception as opposed to abortion. I should explain that in, in the 1870s, people didn't make much of a distinction between contraception and abortion. It was all obscene. It's also true, as Jill hinted, that, that Sanger helped to construct a particular history of that movement, which put her front and center. She was not alone in doing that. Uh, it's done all the time by, by leaders. And in fact, she was in the company of two famous 19th century suffragists, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan Anthony, who did exactly the same thing. Okay, so she was quite charismatic, contracted very quickly some very, very spunky activists. And uh, after, immediately after birth, World War I, birth control was clearly a widespread social movement. There were birth control leagues in just every major city. They published things, they opened clinics, they raised the funds to pay for those activities. It was very rough going. Uh, there were a lot of, of, of clinics that were closed. There were a lot of uh, incredibly abusive language directed at the people doing this. Um, as that developed, the movement developed what I see as a series of strategic alliances uh, which helped them win over reluctant state legislatures. And remember, they had to convince every state legislature to uh, decriminalize uh, this process. Uh, the first, had to, first of these strategic alliances had to do with the medical profession. The birth control clinics first used nurses, but soon sought out uh, physicians to fit women with cervical diaphragms, which are the new version of the older pessaries. Uh, Strategy number one that I want to point to was seeking medical support and building that alliance. Um, the, the result actually would have seemed rather bewildering to the very early uh, birth control advocates because contraception became legalized as a medical matter, making diaphragms a device available only by prescription by a doctor and making doctors the arbiters of whether it's appropriate for women to get diaphragms. Um, I might also point out that there's really no good reason uh, for uh, this form of contraception to require medical supervision. Um, 
Any woman who can use a tampon can learn to <laughs> use a diaphragm, and there is absolutely nothing you can do to injure yourself with a diaphragm, <laughs> short of maybe eating it. Uh, but this medicalized, uh, and I'll ma make the point, obviously, once you had hormonal contraceptives, once you had intrauterine devices, of course, you have to have medical supervision. But this medicalization had a number of negative effects. It made contraceptives more expensive. It made the birth control clinics more expensive to run. It saddled the birth control movement with having to spend enormous amounts of time raising money. And it kept birth control inaccessible to low-income women, and uh, particularly, I might point out, to rural women. And I do want to point out the racial implications of that, because in these early years, the vast majority of African Americans still lived in the South and were rural. The vast majority of Mexican Americans, or Latinas, uh, lived uh, in the Southwest and in rural areas. Now, the second strategy I'm not going to dwell on, because that's the alliance with eugenics. And Adam spoke about that, and, and Dorothy's going to follow up on that, uh, particularly about the um, particularly racist aspects of the legacy that that left. But I want to just point out one other thing. The original, the earlier eugenists in the era of President Theodore Roosevelt, um, they had a double, thi a double thing, as Adam suggested. They wanted the, quote, inferior people to reproduce less, but they wanted the superior people to reproduce more. And they were on about constantly attacking elite, educated women who at that time were having fewer children and very frequently were simply not marrying and having children at all. That, that fell away. Sanger was clearly never a part of that attack on the rights of women to entirely avoid having children if that's what, what they wanted to do. The third strategy resulted from the weakening of feminism uh, from the 1920s on, and it involved attempting to skirt controversy by increasingly presenting contraception as a tool for wholesome families rather than a woman's right. Uh, it also rested, again, on this new understanding that the role of sex was extremely important in marriage and that, therefore, birth control was a tool for a better marriage as well as for healthier and fewer children. Um, as the movement gained strength, activists moved toward greater emphasis on family health, and it was, on the whole, a productive move. For example, it even resulted in a very tiny first federal program of introducing birth control to poor rural women during uh, the New Deal, uh, run by, out of the Farm Security Administration and the Department of Agriculture. And I, I can't help but think that, that had President Franklin Roosevelt been able to achieve uh, the welfare provision that was one of his, what is dearest to him and one of his highest priorities for obvious reasons, which was universal medical insurance, we would maybe today be in a rather different place because it would have been interesting to see had we had medical insurance started in the, new, in the 1930s and continued into the period of the war, whether birth control would have been a covered uh, a, a, a covered issue. Um, the, um, then, and uh, I'm not going to go on to talk more about Planned Parenthood in this intervening period because uh, Jill did a bit and so did Ellen, but in the, I want to talk about the feminist revival that began at the end of the 1960s and moved uh, and evolved, it developed just a few years after Sanger death, and I would have found it extremely interesting to think how she would have reacted, and I suspect she would have reacted positively. Uh, they, this movement began to return to women's rights arguments about why reproduction control was important. I, I would say that in this movement, I think it was less a strategy than it was an outburst of indignation and outrage. Outrage at state intervention into women's lives and bodies, at it also developed out of the uh, real scandals that the women's movement exposed of the inadequate testing of the birth control pill and the m major health problems, and as well as just simply the specter, what we just saw in Texas, of male legislators making these decisions, not only about 
what women should do, but often about what women should know uh, about themselves. Now, the, there's an important historical lesson that I want to point out here, and that is that the same practice, i.e. birth control, can take on different meanings in different historical contexts. And I would argue that in the 70s, birth control came to seem a feminist issue, which it had not particularly seemed in the period just before that. And um, as a result, it was uh, front and center, as Jill explained, in the huge backlash against the women's movement that began to overtake people in the, in the years afterwards. Now, I'm not suggesting that it was a mistake to redefine birth control as a women's right. I don't think that, well, first of all, we historians are not in the business of saying that people are mistaken. This is something that historically happened, and I, but I also would point out that you have to think about the an, other enormous contributions that this new women's rights consciousness brought to all of us, including uh, in the field of health, and I might just point out that I think it's because of women's movement pressure that we have turned breast cancer into a essentially curable disease in many cases. I mean, so this is, these issues are, are really vital and can't be written off. But um, on the other hand, we do have to understand that in every, every gain, may also produce some losses or, so, or rather some new challenges and new problems. So, so um, I, I am sure you all know, just in conclusion, that the threat to destroy Planned Parenthood comes from the so-called Right to Life campaign. But you may not realize that the very slogan, Right to Life, which I consider, I consider the coining of that slogan probably the greatest victory of the anti-abortion movement. That slogan emerged as it was a marker of what women had achieved. In the 19th century, the movement against reproduction control uh, argued over and over that their purpose was to stop women from aspiring to leave their God-prescribed role in the home, uh, to stop them from uh, this rush into higher education, into careers, into political activity. In the, the, 18, in the 19th century, issues of a fetus were almost never mentioned, or a so-called unborn child. But by the time you get to the 1970s, I think, uh, the women's movement had changed the universe of discourse enough so that it was just no longer, uh, no longer acceptable to overtly say that you oppose these forms of reproduction control in order to force women to stay in certain places. Um, it's, uh, it's, again, uh, one of these stories about how uh, gains always produce new problems, and the new problems have recently escalated. We live in very dangerous times with respect to these issues, and I, as I was writing this, I, I found myself wishing that uh, perhaps we had a, a Margaret Sanger with her incredible energy and single-minded focus to help us in this battle. Thank you. So we're doing an awful lot of talking and uh, unpacking a huge number of issues over the course of a century uh, in a short conversation. Um, I, before I try at the end to sort of give a, a roadmap to fill in a few details that may be confusing to you, I want to invite um, my longtime colleague Dorothy um, to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the history of um, race and uh, specifically um, and in the context of the birth control movement because this has been so misrepresented um, in recent years and yet there, there are some kernels of concern but um, also some reason um, to uh, reject some of the tropes or um, uh, misunderstandings um, of the relationship between the two movements. So Dorothy, Roberts, who wrote a, a fantastic book called Killing the Black Body. Um, when I wrote about Sanger in the 1990s, I tried to explain that she went to Congress in the 1930s um, to try to encourage um, the uh, enthusiasm for planning, social planning and economic planning, uh, to include family planning. In fact, she invented the term, I, 
we heard something from Jill that I never knew about another reason for perhaps changing the name from um, the birth control movement to the Planned Parenthood movement, but it's my understanding is that it was located literally in a desire to be part of the new enthusiasm for social planning in the 1930s. Um, in addition, she very much wanted um, the uh, welfare uh, considerations to include um, support for voluntary contraception, always voluntary. Um, Dorothy points out in her book, and I think it's an, an extraordinarily important insight, that on some level this created a situational ethics that we've lived with forever in the United States, um, where uh, it's the right of all women to use contraception, but an obligation of poor women. And I'd like you to expand on that and also, however, explain the role that not only Margaret Sanger, but W.E.B. Du Bois, um, who was mentioned earlier as a supporter of uh, the Harlem Clinic by Jill. Um, in fact, he was a close associate of Sanger's also in the project she did uh, in rural. Um, so <laughs> let, let Dorothy talk about it. Okay, sorry. I, <laughs> Thank you. In, in rural areas, but okay. Well, I think it's extremely important to understand that the birth control movement in the United States entangled both emancipation for women, as Margaret Sanger championed, with control of populations. It, they went hand in hand, unfortunately, partly because of historical coincidence but also because of ideologies that existed at the time. You cannot separate eugenics from white supremacy and racism. Eugenics was a racist movement and it was linked very directly to Jim Crow laws that wanted to preserve white purity. So the law that Adam mentioned that was at the root of the uh, Buck versus Bell that allowed for the mandatory sterilization of Carrie Buck was passed on the exact same day as the ban on interracial marriage. And they were a package. Uh, eugenics and Jim Crow were both progressive movements to try to better society according to the racist norms that existed at the time. And as Adam has mentioned, Margaret Sanger uh, was a champion of women's emancipation through birth control, but she also strategically used eugenicist rhetoric and rationales to support her, uh, her agenda. Now, at some point in the 30s, the attention of eugenicists, which mostly was on what were considered inferior races among Europeans, uh, Jews, Italians, other Southern Europeans. In fact, that was the basis for the immigration ban uh, or quotas on certain European immigrants uh, to the United States, especially from Southern and Eastern Europe. They turned their attention to black people in the South and, uh, as I mentioned, wanted to preserve white racial purity through anti-miscegenation laws, but also were concerned about reducing the birth rate of blacks in the South. And uh, that mission coincided with the Birth Control Federation of America's Negro Service Division that was established in 1939. And I think that Sanger and others in that uh, division Sanger was then the honorary chair of the Birth Control Federation of America, and she was very involved in bringing birth control to rural blacks in the South. Uh, and I, I think she saw it as a sort of missionary mission, vision to uh, spread access to birth control among black people, just as she was spreading it among poor white people uh, in, in urban areas. Uh, she used paternalistic language about how to get black people to use birth control. Uh, and again, she was writing the kinds of things that Adam mentioned, but it's not, I don't think it's right to paint it as if she was, her point was to 
eliminate the black population. Her point was to provide access to uh, women, black women in the South. She also established, in conjunction with the Urban League uh, and W.B. Du Bois, uh, Mar uh, Mary uh, Bethune, McLeod Bethune was on the advisory council uh, for the clinic in Harlem that was established largely because of a demand for access to clinics in Harlem. The clinic that uh, Ellen showed uh, earlier with white people, white women lined up, it was segregated, you know. I mean, this medical care was segregated in the United States in the 1930s. And so black women who had already been using birth control were advocating for access to clinics, uh, as were leaders in the black community like Du, Bo du Bois and um, Bethune. So we have to understand Margaret Sanger in this context of racist eugenicist policy that was promoting a version of science and laws that sought to control the birth rates of populations that were deemed inferior at the same time that Sanger was championing birth control for the emancipation of women and wanted to provide access to women uh, beyond uh, the white women who were, had the greatest access at the time. So it's not right either to see birth control as being imposed on black women against their will, nor is it right though to ignore the fact that the Birth Control Federation of America used eugenicist rhetoric and rationales in order to promote birth control for black people in America. Now, this failure to grasp the tension between advocating for birth control for emancipation of women, for women's control of their own bodies, and birth control for population control has led to the continued exploitation of black women, devaluation of black women's decision making for themselves, their families, and their communities by both sides of the reproductive health and rights battles. So that in 2011, we saw billboards going up around the country from an anti-abortion campaign that said, for example, the most dangerous place for an African American is in the womb. That is a message that comes straight out of eugenicist logic that black women's childbearing is dangerous and has to be regulated. But here it was used by anti-abortion advocates who distorted the history of birth control in black communities, painted Margaret Sanger as if she were purely out to exterminate black people, and blamed, I think it just as importantly, you know, Ellen said Margaret Sanger's reputation has been tarnished, but black women's <laughs> reputation has been tarnished even more, that black women should not have are incapable of making reproductive decisions for themselves. And so, ironically, this language that could come straight out of eugenics is being used by anti-abortion campaigners to restrict black women's access to abortion and exploit black women's reproductive decision-making to further their ends. At the same time, though, that we recognize that this is a distortion of history and a, a way of demonizing black women for the sake of anti-abortion campaigning, we always have to remain vigilant about the potential for birth control to be used as a form of population control and be actively aware of eliminating that way of thinking from the movement for reproductive freedom and justice. Uh, it is not the case that birth control, we should support it in order to keep certain people from reproducing because their reproduction causes social problems. 
I think this is where we have to still be critical of that aspect of Margaret Sanger's rhetoric where she saw birth control as a way of solving the problems of you know, women living in the slums or black women in rural areas. Birth control, family planning, abortion is a, should be a human right for people to be able to control their own bodies, not a tool for other people to impose on women to say they should be controlled. That's not fair. So we were supposed to leave some time for questions. Maybe we have a few, um, but I think just to sum it up, uh, I wanted to say that scholars working in this field um, have understood the conundrum of disciplining reproduction. Reproduction is experienced individually and socially at the same time, and balancing the rights for individual self-expression without in any way compromising um, uh, those rights of individual self-expression uh, self um, is truly the goal. Um, it's certainly at the heart of the Planned Parenthood movement today, which puts front and center uh, informed consent um, for all of the services that it provides, um, but has been demonized um, by individuals who don't understand this tension. I, I do want to close, because I do want to close on an optimistic note, by saying that in um, the 1940s, Margaret Sanger interviewed in the Chicago Defender, the leader leading black paper in the country, uh, said a quote that's very important. Uh, she said, uh, birth control is an issue to uh, a democratic intervention to be democratically uh, applied. And it was always her desire to um, involve the public health um, apparatus of this country and the government in the application because that those governments, and this is true when she went abroad as well, w at least had democratic accountability. She never wanted one group of people or one individual to tell another uh, how many children uh, she should have. Um, and the politicization of the, um, of, of the matter that had prevented for so many years, first during the New Deal when fundamentalists and Catholics were central to the New Deal coalition and later, as you heard from Jill, um, when uh, the Republican Party made uh, a p opposition to abortion and to a lesser extent to contraception and sex education, although it's not very much of a lesser extent, and that's something that will be talked about later, um, as central to a, you know, a kind of litmus test for their candidates. Um, we in this country, more than any other, have politicized this issue um, and made it a partisan issue in, in ways that have been not productive. So uh, is there any time for questions? I mean, we, we started late, so we have about 10 or 15 minutes left. Um, and I guess they're collecting um, cards here. Yeah, cards. I, I don't know how much. Well, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna see what I can read. Okay, you've all laid out this coalition of people and interests who brought that birth control into the mainstream. Some of their pretty heinous uh, eugenics. Um, I'm. What does that history, how, how could we learn from the, from the current debate? How, what does it teach us for the current debate? What allies um, could be brought into the movement um, that would be helpful for change? You want to take, mm -hmm. who wants to take that? Well, I would, I would just start, just echo what Dorothy said uh, at the end, uh, that, uh, you know, population control is, has not only been a domestic racist issue, it's also been an international one. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was founded on false pretenses, the idea that you can help the poor by having smaller families rather than redistributing wealth, which is what the poor <laughs> really need. So uh, I just, and I still do hear people say, and I think this is yeah. just what Dorothy is warning us against, well, people should use more birth control because it costs more money mm -hmm. to take care of, if the state has to take care of the children. Mm -hmm. That is uh, the kind of language that I think is, 
well, it's offensive to everyone, but it's particularly threatening to people who are low-income people. And the, those people have been disproportionately people of color. And, uh, you know, one of the things about the forced sterilization, I'll just mention one little blip, and that is that the, the population group that suffered the worst from that were American Indians. The rate of coercive sterilization was there is just appalling. Well, I, I think uh, a reproductive justice perspective, Karen, which we'll talk about on the Karen, next panel, I'm sure Loretta Ross is going to talk about it uh, as well, I believe, on, in her session this afternoon, since she's a leader in the movement, um, is, is a way of bringing together social justice organizations and movements because it is founded in a social justice perspective. And so once you have that perspective, you can see connections between the struggle for reproductive rights and the struggle for black lives and the prison abolition movement and the movement for universal health care for every single person in this country. Uh, and I could go economic justice. You know, they're all related to creating the conditions required for true reproductive freedom. So those are all uh, kinds of coalitions that we can join and bring together, which would obviously lead to a stronger movement for reproductive rights. In this but I would just add that it's also a cautionary tale about who you don't invite into your coalition. I think that Margaret Sanger made a real mistake a by, yeah, by yes. being strategically aligned yes. with the eugenicists, and it led to people like Carrie Buck and 70,000 yeah. people being sterilized, and we need to not make that mistake in the name of just having as yeah. many people under Absolutely. the tent as possible. Just, just to keep, I mean, I'm, I'm always in a defensive posture, but just to keep the facts straight. <laughs> Sanger very much uh, did open the conversation in the 1920s to the eugenicists who, as I said, were ubiquitous uh, and considered part of the progressive movement of the time um, as well, certainly intellectually and in the social sciences, uh, as well as you know, this conservative strain. But she refused categorically to ever formally ally the movements um, when that uh, effort was made in the 1920s. And as Jill pointed out earlier, she was kind of... Um, she, she broke with the American Birth Control League over this issue, in part, um, and also over its reluctance to take the issue um, at the national level and to seek a, a kind of national conversation during the New Deal about uh, legalizing birth control. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated matter. Uh, historical circumstances of these complexity are hard to unpack, certainly uh, in sound bites. Um, <laughs> she says it in her own words here. She says she, that one of her aims is sterilization. Yeah, okay. yeah. So we're, we're, go we're, we're going to, well, again, um, just can we, um, the next, the next question that I can read here, and they're hard to read, is can we, um, can we directly link women's individual rights and population control to the larger questions of natural resources? Um, in other words, um, part of the reproductive justice movement today is also engaging a conversation about uh, environmental uh, justice. Well, but we have to be here again, as, as I think we've been saying, you have to be extremely careful because one of the primary arguments for population control is that certain people having too many babies is a threat to the environment. And the environment uh, movement has, has had a long history of connection to eugenics and mm -hmm. eugenicist thinking. That is different from a an environmental justice movement or anti-environmental racism movement that understands the ways in which capitalist profit-seeking companies are, you know, pollute and destroy environments, especially harming people of color and, and other uh, disadvantaged people in this country and around the world. So it, it, like everything we've been saying, it depends on how, what the rationale is, what the ideology is, what the politics are for making these arguments. And yes, environmental justice, oppose environmental racism and understand how that, those affect, environmental racism affects women of colors and, and 
a whole community's reproductive freedoms, but do, don't use the argument for population control that the wrong people having too many children is a threat to the environment, and that's why their fertility should be reduced. It's a very important distinction. I, I think we're out of time. I can just add one thing. It's sure, not, on. I totally agree, but it's not yeah. only that we can't use the arguments, it's that we have to see what follows from oh, the use absolutely. of those arguments. And the whole population control movement in the global south was based on the premise that if women had f fewer children, there'd be less poverty. Most people who studied it see that the causality goes the other way. Exactly. When people have more hope for a better life, they often choose to reduce their families. And so what you have to do is to think about the, the whole spectrum of what uh, kind of economic justice is needed. Yeah, yeah. On that note, thank you so much, panelists. We'll now take a short break and uh, reconvene in five minutes uh, for our last panel of the morning. <laughs>